Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to start by asking you a few questions about your development as an activist. What events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Well, it's interesting. In my case, there was that aha moment that I could look back on. And that was when I was in high school when the Vietnam War was raging. And my sister, who was two years older, had a boyfriend who was sent off to Vietnam. We had a draft at that time and you couldn't, well, it was hard to get out of it. And he would write her letters and each month they get kind of stranger and stranger. And this very nice, wonderful, all American kid started turning into somebody that it was hard to recognize. And then uh, one day about six months after he was in Vietnam, he sent her a package with a ear of the Viet Cong, the quote enemy, on a, a string to wear as a necklace. And I was so disgusted that I went in the bathroom and threw up and said, I got to do something about this. What is it that turns our young men into monsters? Well, I started an anti-war group in my high school and joined up with the National Students for Democratic Society, SDS, uh, worked on campaigns for anti-war Congress people, and that really launched me into uh, a quest to try to end war that I'm still on. People of our age that I've talked to, the Vietnam War has often been a catalyst for movement into activism. Yeah. You know, which, which is why the uh, people who make wars and run the military industrial complex have changed the way they make those wars so that there is not a draft and the wars are uh, waged by a very small percentage of Americans and they're waged by drones and special commandos and proxy wars. So most Americans don't even know that we're in those wars. But in those days, you couldn't get away from it. And that's why there was such a big anti-war movement led by young people, which as you know, is very powerful. So uh, what continues to motivate you or guide you or give you courage in this time? In the work that I've done over the years, which has ranged from working for the United Nations to working for uh, in, uh, governments overseas, and uh, working for nonprofits, starting my own nonprofits. I've come in contact with people all over the world who I consider to be among the most beautiful examples of humanity. People that are either have no choice to be in the struggle because they are so poor, because their lands have been taken away. I wrote a book about a woman uh, called Elvia Alvarado from Honduras, who lost several of her children to malnutrition, uh, who fought the US military that came in and built a base right near her home. And I remember asking her the same question. And she said, I don't have the luxury to give up. And that really stuck with me throughout the years uh, that I because I live in this country and I have more options, you know, I do in a sense have the luxury to give up, but I don't if you look at it in the broader sense of the moral issues, the impact that our government has on the tremendous inequality here at home, uh, the racism here at home, and the way that it supports uh, those kinds of inequalities and uh, racism and environmental destruction overseas. And now I'm a grandmother and now I have grandchildren and I look at them and I think this is not the planet that I wanna leave to them. And I think that it's for the younger generation now to really make those changes, but I still got a lot of fight left in me and I'll keep going as long as I can to make something better for them. So. Uh, that they can have better lives and that we can feel more uh, proud about the kind of world that we're leaving behind. You know, you could talk about the military budget of $740 billion and what does that mean to people? What does a billion dollars mean? I mean, it's very hard to get a grasp of that. But when you show that there is a bomb that the US produced in a plant in Raytheon in Texas that went and crushed 
a bus of school children in Yemen, killing 42 of them, that uh, suddenly becomes real for people. And it's important to put things in those terms so people recognize that the money we spend on war has consequences in terms of the lives of people who are the victims of those wars. So what advice do you have for youth activists right now? I don't think it matters all that much which issue you work on. And maybe it's good to try a couple of different issues. Spend some time in uh, an aspect of the environmental movement. Spend some time working on a healthcare system for everyone. Spend some time working on the issue of uh, getting free college education so young people don't have to be in debt. Spend some time learning about the military industrial complex that sucks up so much money that we don't have uh, uh, the money for uh, the good things that we really need. Uh, and learn about them by volunteering for organizations. If you're lucky enough to get a job working on uh, some social justice or environmental issues, that's great. But maybe you can't because there aren't that many jobs available. But that doesn't mean you can't still uh, help volunteering some of your time. If you're making a good salary, donated a part of your money, um, becoming the alternative yourself and the kind of lifestyle that you live in the um, way that you help to build up an alternative to the war economy by living in a, a local sustainable peace economy those kinds of things. And I would say never giving up on the anger that you feel towards the way things are and the vision that you have for a world that's very different and so much better and turning the anger into the action. Don't let yourself fall into the despair and cynicism because that really just supports the oligarchs. It supports the uh, fossil fuel industry. It supports the weapons industry. It supports all of those who uh, benefit by keeping the system as it is. So I would just say to keep hope alive and recognize that the world is made by um, the natural system, as well as the way we humans interact with it. We don't have to be uh, these horrific polluters. We don't have to be war makers. Uh, we don't have to accept uh, hatred and bullying and misogyny. All of those uh, are, can be changed by our actions. And they have been in the past and they will continue to be in the future. The question is how quickly they will change. How quickly will the arc of justice be bent towards justice? And that depends on how many of us get involved. So the important thing is to keep at it and keep hopeful. Thank you so much, Medea. I really appreciate your time and, and your energy, your activism, and your advice. Thanks so much.